and let me once again welcome everybody officially to today's webinar, a Conservation Finance Forum event, Lions, Tigers, and Bears. And I'll hand things right over to today's moderator, Jim Levitt, who is the Director of the Program on Conservation Innovation at Harvard Forest. Good morning to all of you uh, during this holiday week. Thank you for joining us to the 35 to 40 people who will be online today and to the 60 or 70 who have registered from literally around the world who will be joining us asynchronously, I expect, sometime over the next week or two. Uh, we have a remarkable panel today to talk to you about uh, an issue that is becoming of uh, great significance in the conservation world. That is landscape scale conservation, conserving land and biodiversity habitat across public, private, nonprofit, and even uh, academic land holdings. Our three, uh, our three guests are Gary Tabor from Bozeman, Montana, Philip Nyhus from Colby College in Waterville, Maine, and Rob Lilholm from the University of Maine in Orono. Uh, each of them will have a brief presentation to give us of 10 to 12 minutes, and then I will field questions from all of you. For them, we will plan to go for about an hour. We may let that spill over uh, a little bit, depending on the volume of, of questions that come in. So first, I want to introduce to you Gary Tabor. Uh, Gary is someone I've known for uh, a number of years. He is a remarkable catalyst for large landscape conservation, uh, has worked literally all over the world on this topic, uh, has published widely, and now uh, has a small staff that is helping to uh, move the, both the dialogue and the action on the ground related to large landscape conservation uh, forward in a way that, that I think uh, really is of international significance. Uh, you can read Gary's um, uh, biography in the slide that you have in front of you. Gary, welcome. Are you, uh, are you online right now? Uh, yes, I am. Thank you, Jim. In fact, I'm sitting here talking in front of my computer with no one around. <laughs> Very good. Well, you've got, you've got 40 people around you virtually. So, uh, Gary, let me, let me lead off by, by asking you a, a simple question and let, let you uh, launch into your slide pack, which is um, how, did, how did the idea of large landscape conservation become uh, uh, an important part of your life? Where, where did you get started with all of this? Well, actually, I got started with this working in Africa. Um, I worked eight years in East Africa, um, four years in, uh, in Western Uganda, and four years in Tanzania and, and Kenya. And I don't want to, um, I guess I, I could segue a little bit to what Rob will talk about, is that in those areas, you've got uh, uh, large landscapes are critical for maintaining the, the large fauna of the region. And after working um, those eight years in East Africa, and and I had a colleague who said, well, it's great. You've done some fantastic things there, Gary. What have you done in your own country? And I could not answer because I had gone off very early to work in East Africa. And when I came back to the U.S., luckily, I ran into a fellow named Harvey Locke, who was a Canadian who had been working with the conservation biology community to help create one of the first large landscape efforts here called Yellowstone to Yukon, and that will be my talk today. Does that answer does that answer you, Jim? Uh, spot on. Uh, take off with your uh, slide pack now for the next uh, ten minutes, and, and then we'll go from there. That sounds great. Well, this is what I, I'm going to talk to you. What I've been involved with since 1993, the Yellowstone to Yukon effort, which was uh, uh, an effort to protect the large fauna of North America. And in a word. The issue that we're dealing with uh, across North America and many terrestrial habitats around the world is fragmentation. This is a slide essentially of the human footprint of Western North America from Carlos Carroll. Uh, he created the habitat effectiveness slide. And while you may see some nice green areas in the southwest, they don't necessarily mean a lot of productivity in like areas of Nevada. We're seeing a huge transformation of our continent. And that transformation is affecting the species that live on our continent. 
in 19, um, in, in, in early 2000, um, uh, Anne La Liberty and, uh, and her colleague, um, Bill Ripple, they created a map essentially of the historic and current trends with regarding the 14 largest, uh, land mammals in North America. And this map shows that from pronghorn to grizzly bears, there's essentially been a retreat since a European, um, discovery of of North America, and that retreat is that you will now find the most of the large mammals in essentially the Yellowstone to Yukon region in the Rocky Mountains of the U.S. Northern U.S. Rockies and Canadian Rockies uh, in North America. And grizzly bears are certainly an iconic element of this retreat. Uh, grizzly bears used to be numbered in a hundred thousands. Uh, in North America, uh, once ranged all the way to Mexico uh, in the late 1800s. But over time, uh, their populations have diminished. They've become islandized, and once they become islandized, they're subject to small population pressures, and they wink out. And so we've been seeing this retreat of, of grizzly bears uh, retreating north. So there's a couple things I want you to pay attention to in, in this slide. Uh, one is that uh, Yellowstone is that nice red dot in the central part of, 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 the, of the picture. Let me see if I can use the pointer here to show you. So this is Yellowstone right here. It's become an island unto itself. And uh, California, which prides itself on the UCL, UCLA Bruins or the Cal Bears or the Golden State of California with the bear as the icon, well, there are no more grizzly bears in California, and in that box is the last grizzly bear. That I think that was in the 1920s, the last grizzly bear uh, shot in California. There are no more, although the icon and the myth of the grizzly bear still exists in the, as part of the identity of the state. But you can see this retreat of grizzly bears, and I also want you to pay attention to this peninsula, which essentially begins around the ecosystem called the crown of the continent that surrounds Glacier and Waterton International Peace Park. And it's this region here because that's an area that's also undergoing some islandization, and that's a big problem for bears. One of the key fragmenting forces uh, for many of the species, especially bears, are roads. And in this area, which we consider one of the wilder parts of North America, the northern Rockies of the U.S. surrounding Yellowstone and Glacier, uh, National Park and the Big Wilderness in Idaho, well, there's actually a lot of roads in this area. A lot of people don't know. In fact, the most isolated part in North America is found in the thoroughfare in Yellowstone, and that's only 50 miles from a road. And that's not really big given the size of our, or not very far given the size of our continent. And what roads mean is that they're areas of conflict. And bears need habitat to survive, but they also need security. And that's a key thing that people don't realize. They need to have reduced conflict to survive. And roads are a major fragmenting force. Now, just a look at wolves, the kind of the parallel of bears, is that this is what I mean about habitat security. In, in 1995, 15 years ago, 66 wolves were reintroduced into Idaho and Yellowstone. And now they're over 2,000, and that complements about 130 wolves that were estimated to be recolonization from uh, the Canada at that time. So where do you find wolves, and this is from uh, National Geographic in 2010, these wolf packs only exist where there is secure habitat. So those areas that you saw in the previous um, slide that had no roads show you where you have wolves. And essentially, where you have secure habitat, you have not only wolves, you also have bears. And you may think it takes a lot of roads to create a genetic distinction in a population. Well, we know that there are roughly 600 and some bears in Yellowstone. That's an island. But we also know that here's that peninsula again that I asked you to pay attention to. As you go farther north, there are about 900 bears. This is Kate Kendall's work with USGS that did this huge survey that was actually ridiculed by Senator McCain. You might have uh, caught it uh, at, during the presidential campaign. He called it a one of the pork projects, but we didn't really know how many bears uh, there were in around Waterton and Glacier National Park. So there are about 900 bears, and then what a fellow named Mike Proctor, a scientist in the U.S. and Canada, has been studying with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, is actually that those bears, those 900 bears, are actually genetically isolating themselves from the 600 bears farther north into Canada, 
And that's due to the factor of one road, which is Highway 3, that one road that's uh, the southernmost uh, trans-Canadian highway that runs near the U.S.-Canadian border. So even one road can have a huge impact on the genetics and demography of grizzly bears. So looking at these fragmenting forces and looking at the scale that nature has to be conserved, in 1993, a combination of Canadian and American uh, conservation biologists who realized that size does matter in terms of conserving large species, especially species that have, need, have large home range needs, like grizzly bears and wolves, and the Yellowstone to Yukon effort came into being. And it's amazing because it builds on essentially the, the protected area and conservation and wilderness heritage of North America. There are over 700 protected areas. It's 3,200 kilometers or 2,000 miles long. It has the first international peace park, which is Waterton Glacier Park, the first park in Canada, which is Banff, the first park in the U.S., which is, which is Yellowstone, and the first uh, natural uh, heritage site, which is Nahani Park, way up in the Northwest Territories. And YOI um, has something, at one point had 300 NGO and even governmental partners like Parks Canada involved. So it was a bottom-up. It was the conservation community working at the grassroots level, reaching to a larger scale. I have there the, the uh, uh, URL for those who want to find out more, YOI.net. But YOI has essentially been a model for large landscape conservation because with a bold vision, people started to think bigger. And now there are over 140 large landscape efforts around the world in IUCN, uh, by IUCN uh, uh, stats. And one of the issues in terms of the science of these large landscape uh, efforts was connectivity, ecological connectivity. It was a theory back then. Does it really work? Well, since 1993, there's been a lot of empirical evidence, in fact, a lot of experimental evidence that shows that wildlife corridors and connectivity does work. You can design it, you can do it for birds, you can do it for plants, and you can do it for just about any species. Connectivity is a, a viable function in the ecology, and it has been proven. And this is what y to y is based on, and this is what justifies these large landscape efforts to combat fragmentation. Now, the element of fragmentation is that fragmentation exacerbates the stresses that are induced by climate change. And so when um, Nicole Heller and Erica Zavaleta from U University of Santa Cruz, they did a review of what is the best thing that we can do with regards to climate adaptation. And they did a review of management recommendations going back 22 years, and the number one recommendation given was that you can increase connectivity. So connectivity is not only good in terms of responding to fragmentation, it's also good in terms of allowing species to respond to climate change so they can track changes in climatic factors. And back to bears, if you look at Y to Y, bears aren't evenly distributed. In fact, they tend to be where the habitat is secure, they're found in areas where that secure habitat is, wilderness areas, national parks. And so if you were to graph Y to Y, essentially the, air, the region along, uh, the, uh, along your graph here, you can see that bears are not evenly distributed. In fact, it's fragmented. You can see Yellowstone, between Yellowstone and Glacier area, there's no bears at all, and that's one of the issues, is trying to reconnect that region. Well, is there hope in terms of reconnection? Well, one thing is that small things do help, and there's been a lot of advance in road ecology. In fact, at Harvard, you have Richard Foreman in the School of Architecture, uh, Landscape Architecture, and he has been a pioneer in road ecology. And here in Banff National Park, this is the twin Trans-Canada Highway. It's also been called the Berlin Wall of Biodiversity. And in the um, mid-1990s, Parks Canada experimented with two 50-meter-wide uh, wildlife crossings, and people were wondering whether they would work or not, especially in terms of maintaining connectivity for species that people cared about, the large mammals. Well, if you were to measure the use of that of these crossings the, during the first five years, you would think not very much. But over time, animals can adapt, and they did learn. So over time, since um, 1996, for the last uh, 14 years, 
we have seen over 200,000 individual animal crossings and 860 individual, and I'm tired now, I think it's over 900 individual grizzly bear crossings. And they're not all the same grizzly bear crossing back and forth. So we also are having the genetic information coming to light as well. So we can see that these little small steps can um, have a, make a difference with regards to rows and the fragmenting forces. But beyond that, you know, always protecting and securing habitat is a key thing. And I know this is the Conservation Finance Forum. Well, this valley, which is the Swan Valley, which links um, uh, Bob Marshall Wilderness, which is just south of Glacier National Park, with the Mission Mountain Wilderness, which is in the Flathead Indian Reservation in northwest Montana, this is an area that has been a checkerboard, a legacy, um, from the railroad uh, era where you had uh, public and private lands in this checkerboard pattern. Um, and you can see a little bit of the checkerboard right here on the map. You can see it's uh, Plum Creek timber essentially logged over the, this, this, this square while the Forest Service has this square. Gary, this, is Jim, Gary, this is Jim Levitt. You got a, like a one or two minute warning. Okay, thank you very much. I'll, I'll be done in, in that time period. So anyway, this is the large, this is one of the largest land deals in, in North America. It was a half a billion dollar deal. Um, it just was completed literally last week. If Eric Love and Ann Dahl were on the phone, they participated and had a key role in this area. And this is key grizzly bear habitat that you, that was protected by private land from Plum Creek timber, 310,000 acres conserved. So since Y2Y was formed in 1994, um, I have, been, have a back of the envelope calculation of lands protected, and we've protected 29 million acres, and this does not include the nearly 20 million acres that are part of the roadless rule. So altogether, since Y to Y has been around, a big vision has equal to big results. So not only small efforts like road crossings, it's also dealt with protected area uh, enhancement of nearly 40 million acres. And finally, you know, why do I, because it's a can-do process and it is an example of what you can do at a larger landscape, it has inspired other efforts around North America and around the world. The Western Governors Association, 19 Western states, red and blue, unanimously agreed to protect wildlife corridors as part of their policy framework, a lot of it based on the science and work in why do I. And so wildlife corridors and connectivity options are being uh, essentially replicated all across the West, and the U.S. Department of Interior has essentially in, in introduced the Landscape Conservation Cooperative, which is a large landscape framework for the way the federal government will do business, both within the U.S. and with partnerships with Canada. And then Patagonia has said the corporations, the corporate sector, can get involved in connectivity with their effort, Freedom to Roam. And that, I'll end it on there, is that this effort and this kind of work is growing and working all around the world. Gary, Gary, that was tremendous. I just want to add a historical note, uh, which is that Yellowstone to Yukon begins, obviously, at Yellowstone National Park, which is the first national park in the world. So there is not only a geographical continuity, there's a historical continuity where we are uh, in the 21st century, the late 20th century, uh, beginning to build corridors off of anchors uh, that are offered by our national parks created two human lifetimes ago, 140 years ago. So this is, this is a story that uh, began with Ulysses S. Grant and is uh, continuing today, and I'm sure we'll have uh, a lot more uh, actually very encouraging progress over the next uh, several years. So I want to transition now uh, from bears to tigers and from North America to uh, Central and South Asia. Philip Nyhus is a, uh, an associate professor of uh, environmental studies at Colby College, has an incredibly dedicated group of young students working on environmental study issues uh, there in Waterville, Maine, and just came back from, uh, from a remarkable conference in St. Petersburg, Russia, focused on uh, protecting some of the last remaining habitat in the world for wild tigers. So, Philip, do you want to uh, launch into your slide pack from there, please? 
All right. Uh, thanks a lot, Jim, for the introduction, and it's a pleasure to join you and Gary and Rob and everyone listening in on this special holiday edition of the broadcast. Before I discuss the key outcomes and innovations that occurred at the international forum you mentioned, I want to begin by just really briefly providing a bit of context about the status of wild tigers, why wild tigers in trouble, and why this matters. At the end of the talk, I'm going to just briefly mention the implications of the forum for a decade-long project I've been involved with in China. Let's start with the basics. What are tigers and where are they found? There's one species of tiger, Panthera tigris, and it is found only in Asia. I get asked a lot how they're doing in Africa, not very well because they never occurred there. We think there may have once been around 100,000 tigers roaming the forests and grasslands of Asia, but three subspecies are now extinct and the populations have declined quite a bit. Indonesia lost the Bali tiger in mid-century, the Javan tiger sometime in the 70s or maybe early 1980s, and the Caspian subspecies disappeared from Western Asia by the 1970s. Today, there are probably an estimated 3,000 to 3,500 tigers left in the wild, and depending on whether you are a lumper or a splitter, there is five or six remaining subspecies. The Bengal is the most abundant, found in India, Nepal, and Bangladesh. The Amur tiger is found in the, in the far eastern part of, of Russia. The Indo-Chinese tiger is found throughout mainland Southeast Asia in recent genetic analyses uh, by Su Jin Lo and, and colleagues suggest that the Malayan subspecies, so the Isthmus of Kra, may be unique. And then you have the Sumatran tiger with maybe 300 tigers on the island of Sumatra. My colleagues at the Minnesota Zoo and I completed and published a study a decade ago that found that the South China tiger is likely extinct in the wild, and today there are maybe only about 90 putative South China tigers that remain in captivity. So how did we get to this point? There are three big reasons why wild tiger populations have plummeted. The first is habitat loss and degradation. Today, tigers occupy just a fraction. Uh, Eric Sanderson and his colleagues published a paper uh, recently that estimated that tigers only occupy about 7% of their historic range. And in the past decade alone, an estimated 40% of tiger habitat has disappeared, according to analysis by Eric Dinnerstein and his colleagues published in Bioscience. This isn't really surprising when you consider that the tiger is found in three of the world's four most populous countries, shares the land with about a third of the world's human population, and occurs in countries with the world's fastest growing economies. The second is human wildlife conflict. Virtually all tiger range states once had official policies to eradicate tigers and formal and informal hunting of tigers to protect people and livestock eliminated tigers from huge parts of their range. More recently, of course, illegal poaching for local consumption and more importantly, the international trade in traditional medicine is threatening to eliminate the world's last wild tiger populations. So we've had a lot of heroic individuals and dedicated conservation organizations that have worked to conserve tigers in their habitat, but the blunt reality is over the last couple decades, we've been losing the battle. We have less habitat and fewer tigers than when we started. And I think a big reason for this has really been lack of political will. We simply haven't made the political and the financial commitment to save tigers and their ecosystems. This may have just changed at least a little bit. Uh, some of you may know this has been a special year for tigers because it is the year of the tiger in the Chinese lunar calendar, and as a result, there's been unprecedented international attention on these threats I just mentioned. The International Tiger Forum that Jim mentioned and I attended last month in St. Petersburg, Russia, as a representative of the Wildcat Conservation Legal Aid Society and is my role here at, at faculty member Colby, was historic because for the first time, heads of government and the world's leading financial and conservation institutions came together to declare they would not let a species go extinct. The meeting was hosted by President Vladimir Putin of Russia. This was a picture taken on the last day of the event, and the forum included high-level representation by all 13 Tiger Range states, along with additional countries like North and South Korea, where tigers once lived, uh, or countries like the United States that has a strong interest in, in conservation. And these representatives include uh, Premier Wen Jiabao of China. 
He is the third from the left, and the Prime Minister is of Nepal, Bangladesh, and the Lao PDR. The meeting was facilitated by the World Bank, and the bank's president, Robert Zellick, second from right in my picture, was in attendance, along with heads of the Global Environmental Facility, the IUCN Species Survival Commission, UN agencies, heads of major international conservation organizations like World Wildlife Fund International, Wildlife Conservation Society, Smithsonian, and, and others. The key outcome of the meeting was the St. Petersburg Declaration, which recognizes that tigers face imminent extinction in the wild and acknowledges that tigers are an important indicator of ecosystem health, or as a colleague and I wrote in a recent article, where tigers live, biodiversity thrives. Importantly, the signatories agreed to try and double the number of tigers in the wild by 2022, the next year of the tiger. Among other commitments, countries that signed the agreement agreed to strengthen regional and bilateral law enforcement activities, uh, such as building on the successful Southeast Asian Wildlife Enforcement Network, developing and implementing country-specific tiger management plans that were prepared before the meeting, and encouraging further transboundary cooperation. An unprecedented 350 million U.S. dollars was committed to tiger conservation at the meeting. And this doesn't include investments already being made by some tiger range states to protect and restore tiger populations Notably, India is planning to spend several hundreds of millions of dollars to help people migrate from core tiger-protected areas, as well as to add something like eight new tiger reserves to their existing um, tiger network. Russia committed to protecting tigers and is working with local communities in the Russian Far East. Leonardo DiCaprio came and donated a million dollars to WWF for this effort. China stated its plans to work on cross-boundary tiger conservation with its neighbors, to clamp down on illegal trade of tiger parts and to establish an ambitious plan to restore the critically endangered South China tiger, which I'll mention briefly at the end. Of course, there was also plenty of criticism. It was unclear how much of the committed funds were new, who exactly would receive these funds, whether these funds would help the people who do the most but often get the least resources and recognition, like the park guards uh, and others on the ground. There's also considerable discussion among tiger conservation NGOs about whether China can reduce domestic demand for tiger parts. There were several interesting conservation innovations that were discussed, and some of the key ones included how we can use RED, reduced emissions from degradation, deforestation, carbon financing, or payment for ecosystem services and other innovative sources of financing to fund tiger conservation moving forward. One of the most interesting examples of this was presented by Eric Dinnerstein and his colleagues who published a recent document uh, looking at the wildlife premium market for wildlife conservation. And he presented a really interesting example currently underway in Nepal and several other places where they are using high resolution satellite imagery the forest using LIDAR data to better estimate standing forest carbon. This way, areas that have healthier forests can achieve a higher price on the, on the carbon market. There was also, and I think this is really important, a lot of discussion about how we have to work toward the idea of what was called smart green infrastructure and work with the very agencies that are responsible for development if wildlife conservation is to succeed. It was pointed out by several speakers that no matter how much is invested in conservation, and $350 million is a lot of money, there are going to be trillions of dollars more invested in roads, dams, and other infrastructure. And if we don't start to capture that and work with those planning agencies, we're going to have trouble. And I'd be happy to talk with folks at the end um, about that. The meeting also had a few implications for my own work in China. For the past decade, I've been part of an international team with Dr. Ron Tilson at the Minnesota Zoo and others, advising the government of China on whether and where to restore wild populations of South China tigers. Premier Wen Jiabao at the meeting stated China's commitment to doing this, and my colleagues and I will be moving forward quickly this coming year. We hope to work with our Chinese counterparts to carry this out. This project will be the first time tigers have been reintroduced on a large scale back into the wild, and indeed this is one of the first large carnivore restoration attempts in Asia. This is particularly challenging because unlike a lot of areas of North America, there are very few forests left in south-central China, and what's left is really degraded. 
I hope we can have another conversa uh, conversation like this in a few years to see whether we've succeeded in restoring prey populations and ultimately wild populations of South China tigers uh, back into China. Let me just close by saying this is a, a pretty critical time for wild tigers, but at the same time, we're experiencing an unprecedented level of global political and financial commitment. And this is a picture I took of the final uh, session of the meeting, I think a lot of hope. Whatever limitations there were from this meeting, and there were plenty, and recognizing it was just one meeting, I think nevertheless has the potential to be a historic turning point for tiger and biodiversity conservation. Certainly it was noteworthy that the leaders of the countries with some of the world's largest economies and populations, the World Bank, and others publicly declared and committed that they will not let one of the world's most beautiful animals and the ecosystems they rely on and the biodiversity they protect to disappear. Thanks, and I look forward to answering any questions you may have when we're done. Terrific presentation. Thank you so much. I just want to comment on that one that uh, those of you who have been listening to these sessions for a while know that I like to go back and think about what makes a, a truly landmark uh, innovation and conservation uh, notable. And uh, one of the five criteria is that the, the dialogue is strategically significant. And I think when you have a dialogue that includes uh, Wen Jiabao, Vladimir Putin, and uh, Bob Zelik from the World Bank, you've got something that is significant at a global level. And uh, I congratulate you, Philip, and your colleagues who have been studying tigers for so long for elevating this issue to their attention. Okay, our last presenter is uh, Rob Lillehome. Rob is um, a professor at the University of Maine in Orono and is uh, particularly focused on modeling, using uh, modern modeling tools to, to understand how landscapes may change over the coming decades to impact these corridors of uh, habitat that are so essential to the survival of uh, charismatic megafauna, as we sometimes call them in this community of interest. So Rob, um, it's, it's good to have you uh, on this session. Um, are you there? Yes. Yes, I'm here. All right. Well, um, I, I could go on for a long time. Uh, introducing Rob, we're working on a couple of projects together right now, but uh, I will simply say that uh, in addition to having uh, very uh, sophisticated technical skills, he's totally got his heart into this work, and, and it's a pleasure to have the chance to work with him from time to time. So, Rob, why don't you take it away into your slide pack, and I, uh, I will tell you right now that you've got about 12 minutes, and so uh, take it away. Okay, thanks, Jim. First, I'm really delighted to be here and uh, listen to these excellent presentations. Before I get started, I want to acknowledge uh, there are a lot of us that are working on this effort in Kenya. I've got them listed there. Um, what I want to talk about is alternative futures modeling, and I'll talk more about that later in the presentation, but it's this idea of trying to anticipate how landscapes change so we can be more proactive when it comes to, to uh, conservation. Now, a lot of us are aware, Jim, it was good you mentioned the term charismatic megafauna. When it comes to wildlife, it's hard to be Kenya and East Africa. Uh, just the range of species and habitats is really quite remarkable. Um, what people aren't as aware of, but I think the recognition is growing, is that these are also um, species that have tremendous migratory patterns. And when it comes to land-based migration, uh, particularly the wildebeest shown here. This is in the Mara Reserve last uh, October, getting ready to cross the Mara River and head south into the Serengeti. But these migrations are increasingly of interest, one, because there are so few left, and two, they're so critical to sustaining the species on the landscape. And then, of course, the migrations are also important for sustaining some of the more sedentary wildlife. The, the linkages are very complex. But, um, you know, certainly I would imagine will the beast taste good from this picture. <laughs> okay, so some of the uh, issues that are facing wildlife um, and the migrations are common uh, in some of the other talks that we've, we've listened to today. The first, of course, is urbanization. This picture here on the top is Nairobi, very fast-growing city. Uh, the transportation networks that supply that city also 
are displacing uh, habitat and making it more difficult for species to migrate. Mining is also becoming increasingly a concern in some areas of Kenya, especially south of Nairobi National Park. All that growth requires a lot of concrete and uh, building blocks. Deforestation, fencing, and agriculture are also taking their toll on the landscapes, on wildlife populations, and on the ability to migrate. What this is really doing is increasing the fragmentation of these landscapes and making it more difficult for species to migrate through. And then finally, on the uncertainty surrounding climate change. Uh, the current models expect to see warmer temperatures, slightly more precipitation, but more severe and more frequent droughts. And the impacts that that has on wildlife, on migration patterns, and on different cultures, for example, the Maasai pastoralists that have uh, navigated these landscapes for centuries with their, wild, with their livestock and wildlife, all of these are uh, threatened by climate change. So for our particular study, and this has really, there's been a lot of work that's been done over the last, oh, 10, 15, 20 years, but the alternative futures work really has only started about a year, year and a half ago. And the question is, how will future development and climate change affect the sustainability of both wildlife populations and migration patterns? And the species we're really keying in on is the wildebeest shown here. We're looking at three separate study areas, Nairobi National Park, the Maasai Mara National Reserve, and then Amboseli National Park. If we take a look at uh, the study area in general, this is Kenya. We can see Nairobi in the south central part. Um, this is Maasai land to, uh, south of Nairobi into Tanzania. And uh, Kenya is a country of about 39 million people. You can see that this area is up on a high plateau, about a mile elevation. And our three parks now, we've focused in, you can see in the top right, Nairobi, and the circle around Nairobi National Park. And Nairobi National Park is under the national uh, letters there. It's a small kind of lens-shaped park, really right in the outskirts of the city. The second area, over to the left, the Mara Reserve, really forms the northern edge of the Serengeti uh, ecosystem, uh, which is much larger. Uh, the Mara ecosystem continues up north through the Rift Valley. But this is an important area when it comes to wildebeest migration that travel through uh, the Mara and Serengeti. And then finally, the third area is Amboseli. And this is in the rain shadow of Kilimanjaro. You can see Kilimanjaro National Park in Tanzania to the south. Amboseli protects two of five major wetland areas that are, that basically have rise from the, uh, the melting waters of, the, of Kilimanjaro. So we've got our three study areas. And if we focus on Nairobi, Nairobi National Park is, is experiencing the most intense development pressures. This is a view from the west looking east. The city would be over to the left. And then the park in front of us to the south would be what was intended to be an open game migration corridor, which is rapidly being fragmented by both development and fencing. This map here shows Nairobi National Park at the top, the city of Nairobi, and the light arrows at the top are migration patterns that are historic but no longer in existence because of development. The darker arrows in the southern part show the migration patterns out of the uh, park through the Kitengila game area and then down into the Kaputi Plain. These are also now beginning to be uh, pretty severely impacted from development, primarily long road quarters, but also fencing in some of the open areas. To give you an idea, some of the development that we're seeing this is the Kibera slum of about 200,000 people, just a few kilometers north of the park. Over to the east, you can see the edge of the park, the open areas in the, in the photo, and then to the right, uh, some cement factories. When I was there last, there were two cement factories. Now there are five with a sixth uh, in the planning stages. And then fueling those cement factories is a lot of quarrying activity, and a lot of this is taking place just to the south of the National Park. And if we focus in on that, fo on that photo, you can see, and this is really pretty interesting, um, you can see the extensive quarrying that's going on, a lot of it by hand, but increasingly with heavy uh, equipment. And then you can see that riparian corridor, which is almost becoming like a Roman aqueduct. It's raised above the quarried landscape around it. And there's, I think, about a 100-meter buffer that protects that corridor. So in these Slides here show different land uses. On the left, the quarrying. Number two, an idea of some of the fencing behavior that's taking place. 
Number three, uh, extensive uh, eucalyptus plantations uh, for building materials. Number four, just kind of ad hoc settlements that appear. And then number five, and this is interesting, number five is kind of seasonal homes or large end homes that are taking place uh, and being constructed near the periphery of the national park. And this is something we've seen already in a lot of the gateway uh, national parks in the U.S. In the Maasai Mara National Reserve, we don't have the urbanization and development pressures that we see in Nairobi National Park, but we do see a growing and thriving of the tourism uh, sector with new lodges and increased uh, visitation. Also deforestation, especially in the Mao Forest, which gives rise to the Mara River, which is really critical in the area, and then some fencing behavior. And the map on the right shows the circular uh, migratory route of the wildebeest. Uh, you can see in September up in the Mara National Reserve uh, where the animals gather during the dry season. Then as the rains come, they head south. This is a migratory pattern of uh, hundreds of kilometers. Uh, wildebeest populations estimated at um, in, the, in 1.3 million or more. Okay. Ambatelli National Park, pretty much the same types of pressures. We also have some agricultural development pressures as well. So for futures modeling, the idea is to develop these spatially explicit models that can depict a range of future landscapes under different drivers of landscape change, primarily looking at things like biophysical, sociodemographic, and economic drivers. And the key is to understand how the decisions we make today affect the outcomes we, we see tomorrow. So try to be proactive instead of reactive when it comes to conservation. Two main parts of our project. The first is modeling wildebeest migration behavior, and we're doing this with GPS radio collars that send hourly signals to location, and then using agent-based models to figure out their behavior. The other is then modeling alternative future development um, footprints or landscapes using remote sensing and different types of modeling tools, logistic regression, Bayesian belief networks, etc. So going back to the wildebeest uh, agent-based models, this shows the process of uh, darting. This is a wildebeest that was darted in the southern part of Nairobi National Park. The center photo is right when he was or she <laughs> was darted. Uh, then the animal eventually is uh, collared. Uh, blood samples are taken for DNA testing. Center bottom photo, she's back on her feet. On the left, it shows then her hourly migrations uh, since she was darted on October 16th. And right now we have 36 uh, wildebeests that are darted across the three different areas. Then looking at the alternative future scenarios, little has been done so far, but we've got some information here from 1990 and 2000. Once again, this is Nairobi National Park, and you can see the park in the top, and you can see from left to right the increase in red areas, that's agricultural areas, and then the purple, which is urbanization. Right now, we're working with Landsat data to update this to 2010, and then we're also using high-resolution spot data to get at some real detailed projections then of how this landscape will transform under different types of development pressures. So once we understand how wildebeest migrate across this landscape, how they react to differences in forage, water, fragmentation, urbanization, then we can start to begin to understand how they react to new landscapes as we start putting future development patterns or the impact of climate change. So. Kind of summing things up, where we're going at the project is our goal is to develop a range of alternative futures, and then from that, be able to engage stakeholders all the way down to the local level so they can look at those futures and they can help us do a number of things. One, assess and evaluate the futures, but then two, help us develop different alternatives of uh, different types of policies that could be put in place. The idea then is to identify areas for critical needs, things like habitat migration corridors, uh, making sure that development proceeds in a way so that there's sanitation and electrical power and things as basic as that. And then once again, the whole key to all of this is to try to anticipate future conflicts before they occur and be proactive. And then finally, a lot of our work has been supported by the National Science Foundation and then also uh, different institutions at UMaine and CSU and in Africa as well. And um, with that, I am finished. Rob, you, you get the award for cruising through 35 slides <laughs> in a record uh, con concise uh, amount of time. I, I am so impressed. So, Hopefully not too fast, though. <laughs> no, not too fast. I think you, you told a very clear story.
So I want to invite uh, the, the 41 people in the audience who have listened to every word you guys have had to say to uh, offer me some questions uh, via the question box on your, on your screen. I'm going to start the questioning uh, with one of my own, and then we can go from there, and hopefully uh, some of you experts out there, and I know who some of you are, will ask uh, some good follow-ups. Um, so the, 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 the art and science of large landscape conservation, uh, as discussed by the three of you, involves so many fields of uh, study and so many professional disciplines. I just listed a couple for myself. There's uh, biological science, there's international diplomacy, there's project finance, there's social entrepreneurship, there's, uh, uh, there's microbiology and molecular uh, uh, DNA studies, things like that. There is uh, computer science and computer modeling. Uh, and that's probably just uh, skimming the surface of several of the most important disciplines. So my question for each of you, two of you at universities and colleges and one of you uh, who's acting as a catalyst across uh, professional communities, is how do you begin to, to train students and uh, young professionals and uh, seasoned professionals to, to master all of these disciplines to achieve these very large and ambitious uh, Objectives that you're you're discussing for us today, and and uh, I'm sure each each one of you uh, might have something to say on that. Gary, you want to take this first, and then I'll I'll jump to Rob and um, and Philip. Uh, sure, I'll, I'll briefly say that. Uh, listen, um, while you're talking about all those disciplines, you're talking about how we live on this planet, and you know we live on this planet because we need these resources, and so it takes everything that humans can muster and how we organize ourselves and how we use resources to deal with this. So this is a this is a fundamental question of how we live on the planet. And large landscapes are only kind of an arbitrary scale of that, you know, if we want to protect this planet, we have to protect everything in the way that nature works and how ecological processes can sustain ourselves. And and only these patterns of landscapes are just a proxy for these ecological processes that are important for our survival. And then in terms of you know, how do you reach the students, you know, the disciplines. I mean, my role and, and the way I've chosen to focus on this is that um, there, I, I see this as a connector. I, I look at myself as connecting industry, nonprofit community, the um, uh, uh, governmental uh, players, uh, local communities, community-based organizations. You know, we have to figure out some way to connect not only jurisdictions, but connect across the disciplines of our society because we have to f figure out some way to work together on this. Well, well said by someone who holds a doctor's in veterinary medicine degree as, as well as expertise in many, many topics. Uh, Philip, you want to take a swing at that? <laughs> yeah, I think what uh, Gary mentioned was great. And I think part of the story is just recognizing that we need this broad range of disciplines. Um, you know, E.O. Wilson in his famous book talks about consilience, the jumping together of knowledge. And I think whether you're an undergraduate or a graduate or well beyond formal schooling, all these stories are suggesting that we need to move way beyond. Let me just give a, a specific example with tigers. Um, there are a lot of folks now in Asia that are actively working with groups like the military, actively working with planning agencies, actively working with large financial institutions and, and companies that historically weren't part of this story. So I think just recognizing that we need geneticists and spatial analysts as well as economists and others is, is part of the challenge. And I think we've, we've reached that point where it's no longer uh, – you're not criticized if you're not just a disciplinarian, just the opposite. I think um, we're seeing there's a lot of benefit to being able to speak with people from different disciplines and, and to move across. Great. Uh, Rob. Yeah, I strongly agree with everything you said uh, already. What I would add is um, we've got a project right now at UMaine called Sustainability Solutions Initiative, and it's built on three kind of foundational components. The first is this idea of interdisciplinary research, and we all talk about it. It's really hard to do, um, but we need to break down those academic silos and really start working across the sciences. The second thing we're looking at is stakeholder engagement. We're 
looking at ways to engage with the people and across across different um, social demographic groups, um, whether it's government, whether it's you know homeowners, whether it's NGOs, to make sure that what we do results in action, and that's the third part, this knowledge to action. So interdisciplinary research, stakeholder engagement, knowledge to action, I think, are key. One way that I've found to do that effectively is with maps. Nothing brings people together more than a map. Um, you can bring a map into a community that shows their community and what it's likely to look like in 20 or 30 years, and immediately everyone looks at it, and I've done this in a lot of different places around the country, and people don't like what they see, you know, and it's based on past trends. And then you can see, okay, what don't you like about what you see? And you can start to get people engaged in planning and thinking about how their decisions affect the future. And I think that's the first step to really making that meaningful change. All right, excellent. I have a uh, question from Fred Kuntz out in the field who says, increasing public protection of key lands is, of course, essential. But what can be done to increase nature-friendly living on private lands? After all, many, if not most, Large landscapes will have at best 20% of the land protected by public governments, and so the, the idea, of course, is that the rest of, uh, of the challenge has to be taken up by the other sectors. Uh, who wants to take a swing at that? Uh, this is Gary. I'll start off, and I was just going to say it's so nice to hear Fred's uh, uh, virtual question, and I'm a big fan of Fred. Um, I, I will say that... Uh, um, you know the, the ultimate challenge we have um, in our in our on our globe is how do we scale up community-based um, conservation to a landscape scale, especially on private lands. And where I work, Fred, uh, I'm trying to uh, work with many of these community-based organizations, and I call it the 10 percent. I don't think we're going to get you know 100 percent of the people on this planet working for conservation, but I think there's a minority, and I don't know whether it's five percent, whether it's 10 percent, maybe even less than that. But how do we get those actors? And they're very inspired, and they want to do good, and they can work larger than the uh, um, I guess the zone of impact that they have if they work together. And so, um, and a lot of these private land efforts are based on these inspirational people who infect their neighbors uh, by their actions, who show, who by demonstration. And I think the scaling up these private land efforts to a way where they have a landscape scale is one of the ways we can do it. Um, certainly, you know, we're fighting the tide of, of a growing planetary population, but that's what we're trying to do in our area. Rob. Uh... Or, Philip, do you want to add to that at all? Yeah. I could just um, briefly mention okay. that in, in Asia, obviously, there's less, um, at least in parts of Asia, less private land available for wildlife than in parts of North America. But certainly, I think one of the recognitions, and actually getting back to the first question, it's not just an, an academic question, the recognition of, of, of the interconnectedness of life, but it's something that's increasingly being used to promote conservation on private lands. Some great examples are occurring in, in Nepal with the Triarch Initiative to connect different areas and to try and bring benefits to the very people um, who bear the brunt of the costs of having wildlife on their lands. And I think a key piece of the puzzle is how we can make it uh, worthwhile for people to have wildlife, which is a global good, uh, in terms of their local benefits, and that's something that, that we have a lot of work to do, but it's certainly a key piece of the puzzle. Rob, are you, you want to add to that at all? Yeah, uh, I think it's a great question, and it's a real challenge. I, and I think a couple of things we need to do is make sure that those pieces that are in public ownership are the right pieces. Um, an example of that would be initially when the parks were set aside in, in Africa, they really looked at dry season habitat um, with the idea that then during the wet season, the animals would be able to roam in different areas. Um, here in the States, uh, I think the Forest Service has done a really good job of really focusing on how important it is to work with that other 90% of the landscape uh, that's going to be in private ownership, that's going to be responding to different market types and incentives. Um, there are a lot of things going on here in New England that look at that, uh, at those private lands and how to uh, have them complement protected areas, and I think the wildlands and woodlands aggregation approach uh, is an ex excellent example of that. The other thing I like to say, and it's really unpopular, is we mustn't forget that we do have a lot of regulations in place in the U.S. and other places to protect 
different uh, types of habitat and landscape features. And even though regulation is, you know, not in vogue, these laws are on the books. And, and I think as, as conservationists, we need to be sure that when people are violating long established, whether it's wetlands laws or your in Maine shoreland zoning, that we take those laws seriously and build upon those laws when it comes to, you know, looking for additional areas to acquire conservation easements and things like that. That's great. It's uh, it's getting to be near the uh, at the lunch hour on the East Coast. Um, I, I'm going to take one more question. There there are a bunch of them lined up, and I'm sorry I can't get to all of them. Um, this one comes from Steve Boyle, who asks a very important question. I think, and uh, it really goes to the way we organize today's session and the rest of the world. Steve asks each of the projects presented benefits from charismatic landscapes and species. How do we apply these principles on adequate scales to the less charismatic landscapes and places with fewer charismatic megafauna? I work with sagebrush, sagebrush dependent species, dot, dot, dot. And let, let me begin the answers to this question by saying that um, I think one of, the, one of the pieces to solving that puzzle has to do with ecosystem services and with, with realizing that um, lands and habitats in different parts of the North American continent and continents around the world uh, contribute uh, many things in addition to having things that we love roam around on them. They sequester carbon, they pr uh, protect clean water, uh, they do a number of things, and so I, I'm quite sure that over time, uh, bringing uh, and valuing ecosystem services appropriately uh, is going to be part of that mix. Um, who wants to take another swing at that uh, before we thank our, our uh, guests for coming? I could just very briefly, this is Philip, I could briefly mention, first of all, I think, Steve, the, the, the question is actually excellent. And in the case of something like a tiger, I think – the question comes up a lot, you know, why do we have to have this big meeting and invest all this money in tigers? And I think the answer is it's not just about tigers. It really is about ecosystems and the ecosystem services that Jim mentioned and all of the biodiversity that occur in these areas. Um, there are a lot of places where we don't have these large charismatic species, and I think um, the goal is not to, to draw attention away from those areas, but hopefully bring the priority of the, of the problem higher up in the national and global agenda, that, that, that we have a strong need to protect biodiversity everywhere. And in some places, it's, it's looking at the amount of biodiversity. In other places, it's looking at the uniqueness of biodiversity. And I think these are just three examples uh, that happen to have charismatic species, but we could certainly have another conversation where we could draw on other themes that have similar pull um, for conservation, but it's a great question. Uh, this is Gary. I, I think that one of the issues is that um, a lot of these other species haven't had uh, folks uh, touting their charisma. Um, for instance, you know, with the sage step, which is, uh, you know, a lot of people in the world don't know this is like the endemic North American grassland. It's not found anywhere in the world, and it's being hammered. Say, you know, uh, uh, um, and and uh, and folks, you know, we have not done a good job to communicate how important this habitat is. And you know, where I live in Montana, I mean, sage grouse. I mean, that's a that's a, a a huge issue right now. And the awareness of sage grouse as an indicator and umbrella species for or sage habitat is huge. So I think there's a there's an education element here. Rob, the last word. Well, boy, I hate having the last word, but I would agree it's a tough one. It's easy to protect lions and tigers and bears. Um, one thing that's been interesting here in New England is uh, there have been successful efforts to protect not only wild lands and wild processes, but protect traditional land uses. And uh, as a forester, um, I'm very encouraged here and how a lot of lands landscape conservation efforts adopt working for so that it includes that economic contribution of the landscape. And uh, I know you can't do that in all different types of settings, um, and sometimes the dominant land uses really conflict with what it is you're trying to protect. But it, once again, if there are ways that we can try to merge those economic interests with the broader conservation interests, then that's one piece of that puzzle, but it, it is certainly more challenging. 
All right. I want to thank uh, all of our uh, guests who spoke today, uh, as well as all of you who have uh, been with us for an hour and ten minutes. I think this has been an excellent session. I hope we can have more focus on landscape scale conservation as we go forward. I want to wish you all a very happy holiday, uh, and we will see you again in the first quarter and talk to you again in the first quarter of 2011. Good afternoon to you all.